Uh, I'd like to, oh, thanks very much for the kind introduction. I'd like to uh, second all of Paris thanks, especially to the people who made this possible today, and uh, to all of you for coming, because it would be kind of depressing for me to come here and give talk to an empty room. So thanks a lot for coming. Um, as Per said, my background is in academic philosophy. I tend to work on pretty abstract questions in ethics, political philosophy, and philosophy of health economics. So this talk is a little bit of a change of pace for me, but I think it's an important change of pace. I think it's important when you work in areas like ethics and philosophy of science to step back and ask what the work that you're doing on these abstract problems, how it connects up with stuff in the real world. And so today, I'm not going to be giving a philosophy talk. I'm not going to be doing a lot of kind of fancy philosophical moves. But I am going to be making a few points that I don't think would have occurred to me unless I had studied philosophy. So this is not a philosophy talk, but it may be a philosophically inspired talk, or a philosophically informed talk. So whether that's good or bad, I'll let you decide, but that's kind of what I'm planning to do. So the topic is beyond generosity. Um, and because I'm a philosophy professor, I feel like I need to start with a philosophy article, or I somehow we're going to get kicked off the island. So um, I thought a good place to start would be Peter Singer's famous article, Famine, Affluence, and Mobility. This is justifiably certainly one of the greatest hits of philosophy over the last 50 years, by which I mean it's read more often, cited more often, uh, started more debates than the vast majority of articles that have been published over the last 50 years. Um, so before I start explaining, let me just take a quick poll to see what background you guys have. How many people here have read this article in some context or another? Okay, so like a quarter of or something like that. So I'm going to go ahead and explain the main point to everybody else, because it's important. Um, here's what Peter Singer says. Peter Singer says, I'm going to change the order a little bit, but don't worry about that. Imagine you leave the talk tonight, and you're heading back to your apartment, or your house, or your dorm room, wherever, and you're walking by one of the fountains on UCSD's campus, nobody else is around, and you notice that in that fountain is a child who's drowning. Okay? You could easily jump in the fountain, save the child, you would put yourself in no danger, there's like three feet of water, so you're, you'd be fine. You would, though, ruin the brand new shoes that you just bought in our area. You don't have time to take them off before you go in the fountain. Okay? So question, Sainer asks, do you think you have a moral obligation to jump in the fountain and rescue the child? Well, what he says is that we all seem to think that you would have a moral obligation, and in fact, it would be a pretty awful person who just walked by the fountain and said, yeah, but my shoes, and kept going. <laughs> okay? So, Singer says, we all seem to agree that you would have this moral obligation to jump in, rescue the child out of the fountain. So the next question he asks is, if we have this obligation, what explains it? What principle is the basis for this kind of an obligation. And he suggests something like this one here. He says, if it is in your power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby <laughs> sacrificing something of comparable moral importance, you ought morally to do it. So you can see how this applies to the drowning child case. Something very bad, a child drowning, is about to happen. It is in your power to prevent it. Preventing it would mean a sacrifice. You would ruin your shoes and get your hands wet and stuff like that. But surely, your shoes are not of comparable moral importance to the life of a child. So according to this principle, you have an obligation to jump into the fountain and save the child's life. Okay? So this seems like a pretty reasonable sounding principle, reasonable basis for moral obligations. But what Singer says is, notice that if you believe in a principle like this, then you have a lot more moral obligations than you might think you do. So the example that Singer discusses is famine in East Bengal in, 1970, in the early 70s. Okay? East Bengal, basically the same territory as the contemporary country Bangladesh. Bangladesh didn't exist in 1972. And so he's pointed, he points out there's a big famine going on there. A lot of people are dying because they don't have access to the basic necessities of life. Food, clean drinking water, basic medications, things like that. They're dying for this reason, and in 1970, 1972, any one could write a check for $100, send it to Oxfam, Red Cross, some international organization focused on aid. They could take the money over there, and they could save a life. So, if you believe in this principle, then it follows that you should be sending most of your money to Oxfam, or to the Red Cross, because it's in your power to prevent something bad from happening, somebody dying in East Bengal, and it would involve a sacrifice, $100, but surely a life is worth more than $100. So the sacrifice is not of comparable moral importance, Therefore, Singer says you have an obligation to write that check. 
Now, the important thing to realize is that you don't have an obligation to simply write one check for $100. Because, of course, after you send the first $100, there are still lots of people starving, and you can still help them with more money. So the conclusion Singer reaches is not that you should send $100 and $200, but that people like us in affluent parts of the world should be sending the vast majority of our incomes to places like Bangladesh. And of course, there's nothing special about 1970 in Bangladesh. The same situation is going on right now, and it has been continuously from 1972 until today. There are many places around the world right now where you could write a check and you could save somebody's life. So, that's the argument that Singer offers. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through and discussing the argument, because that's not the point of this talk. I said it's not a philosophy talk. What I want to do instead of discussing the content of the argument is discuss the reaction that people have to the argument. So think for a second, all of you, if you haven't seen the argument before, what do you, what, what do you think after seeing an argument like this? So I can report, I'm, I'll take volunteers later, I can report that just about all of my undergraduate students when they read this article, they have the same reaction. And it's a reaction that I bet just about all of you have having now. And the reaction is, well, this sounds like a good principle, but once I see what it asks of me, <coughs> something's got to be wrong. Morality can't ask that much. It can't place burdens that heavy on people in affluent countries. It might be fair for morality to require me to give away you know, some of my income, but most of it, all of it, that's crazy. So that's the reaction that my students have. It's the reaction I suspect a lot of you are having right now. And it's also the reaction that a lot of professional philosophers have had. Okay? So not just that. So I'm going to put up a bunch of titles of articles and books that have been published in the last dozen years or so. And I could put up 100. I could keep going forever. But you notice that all of these articles which discuss Singer's argument or arguments like it, they all focus on the idea, or many of them focus on the idea, that there's something about this idea that Singer's principle is too demanding. So the demands of consequentialism, the moral demands of affluence, Moral demands a non-ideal theory. Give till it hurts. What we can ask of persons. Okay. So there are a lot of articles and a lot of philosophers who seem to hold that same view that my students hold and that a lot of you probably hold, which is that there's got to be something wrong with Singer's principle. It's too demanding. Don't know what it is, but whatever the right theory of morality is, it can't require us to give up that much. Okay. So that's the reaction that a lot of people and a lot of philosophers have had to Peter Singer's article. File that away for a second. We're going to come back to it in about 20 minutes, and we're going to do something more fun and happier. Um, gossip, because everybody likes gossip. So um, there's an organization called the Giving Back Funds, and they're dedicated to increasing philanthropic giving, increasing activity, uh, philanthropic activity, especially amongst entertainers and athletes. So one thing they do every year as part of their mission is they put together this list of most generous celebrities, and they you know, go over all sorts of public records of gifts, and they come up with this list. And if you get on the list, it's kind of a feather in your cap. You get lots of good PR. People write nice articles about you, stuff like that. So let's look at who the most generous celebrities in 2010 were, according to the Giving Back Fund. Their definition of celebrity is a little, little odd. I think it basically means artist or athlete. You're not a celebrity if you're not one of those things. But. Whatever, don't worry about that. So the fifth most generous celebrity was Lance Berkman and his wife Kara. Um, St. Louis Cardinals outfielder, probably playing right now, or something like that. Um, he gave 2.1 million, I believe, to pediatric medical research. Jamie Gertz, the actress, and her husband gave away 2.9 million in 2010. Meryl Streep and her husband gave away $4 million. Nora Roberts, the author, gave away 4.5 million, I believe, to a literacy campaign. And then the number one person on the list is the same as the number one person on the list for just about every year that this has been running. Everybody knows who it is. It's Oprah. She's always number one on these lists. And the impressive thing is, if you look at the difference between number one and number two, there's a little bit of a difference there. Okay? <laughs> Oprah's giving a lot more than anybody else, according to the Giving Back Fund. Okay? Okay, so those are our most generous <laughs> celebrities. So let's get a little more serious and instead talk about America's most generous companies, because Forbes is more serious a news site or something like that. Um, so just like the Giving Back Fund every year, they go through tax returns, public records, and they try to figure out who the most generous uh, companies were in the previous year. So you can see this is almost exactly a year old. It hasn't come out with this year's list as far as I can tell yet. So this is an analysis of fiscal year 2009, um, corporate giving. So they have a bunch of different categories, and one category is the, category is the most generous 
non-pharmaceutical company. You'll see why that's its own category in a second. And the answer, most generous non-pharmaceutical company in fiscal year 2009, according to Forbes, is Tyson Foods. Tyson Foods gave away $16.4 million, which was a little over 10% of their profits, which earned it the title most generous non-pharmaceutical. Now, you might wonder about that number, because most of that $16.4 million is not cash, it's products. Given that they're a food company, I assume it's food. I don't know that for sure, but I assume it's food. And this is the market value of what they give away. And presumably they're a food company, so they ought to be able to make food at less than market value or they're really in the wrong business. So you might wonder whether this is a fair way to evaluate people. So Forbes has a different category for the largest cash donor, people giving away actual money. And the winner is someone you do not usually know for corporate responsibility is Walmart, of all people. Walmart gave away $288 million in cash in fiscal year 2009, as well as $200 million in products. I don't know what that is as a percentage of their profits, but that's a lot of money. So good for Walmart in that respect. Um, so those are like our silver and bronze medal winners. But the big winner, the gold medal, people who got the best PR as a result of this, um, are Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. Pfizer gave away $2.3 billion mostly of pharmaceuticals, in fiscal year 2009, which was almost a quarter of their profits. Okay? That's a lot. Now you can see why pharmaceuticals get their own separate category, because drugs are so expensive that by giving away drugs, you can add up your market value of donations very quickly. And further, it doesn't cost a drug company that much to make the drug, most of the expenses in research and development. So almost always when Forbes says this list, the top three or four positions are all pharmaceutical companies. Nevertheless, though, $2.3 billion, $2 billion is impressive, no matter how much you spend it, so good for Pfizer. Okay, so we talked about celebrities, talked about corporations. There's one other context in which every year you see a bunch of news stories about giving, um, and that is politicians. So, I put the question mark here because it's unclear what's motivating this giving, but set that aside for a minute. We're coming up on a presidential election season, and I guarantee you that about nine months from now, candidates are going to release their tax returns, president and vice president, and news organizations are going to take them apart and start reporting on which politicians are generous and which politicians are stingy. Um, since we don't know who the nominees are going to be yet, though, I'm going to go back to 2007, because I actually have data for that. And so let's look at candidate charitable giving in 2007. One thing I have to say, there's an asterisk here, because uh, John McCain and his wife file taxes separately, rather than jointly, and Cindy McCain, as you may or may not know, comes from a very, very, very wealthy family. So when you look at John McCain's giving, it's unclear how much of it is really his versus how much of it is coming from his wife, because for tax purposes, you can allocate it however you want, um, and all the other three uh, politicians file jointly with their spouses. So there's a little bit of an apples and oranges thing there, but don't worry about it. So anyways, candidate charitable giving, this is what the news article said about, you know, in, I don't know, September of last, uh, 2007. John McCain, 105,000 given to charity in 2007. Impressive. Sarah Palin, a little less than 5,000 given to charity. Barack Obama was the big winner in the charity sweepstakes. He gave 240,000. He and his wife gave 240,000 to charity in 2007. And then Joe Biden. So Joe Biden got into a lot of trouble. And he got into a lot of trouble because Joe gave $995 to charity. <laughs> So that was kind of a mistake. I don't think he knew he was, well, actually he was already running for president at that point, so he's just not very smart in this regard. Um, now you might wonder whether these numbers are fair, because of course some of the people on this list make a lot more money than the other people on this list. So this is the way USA Today reported it, but other people reported it as percentages of overall income. Things look a little differently if you do that. So McCain now looks really good, almost or over a quarter of his income. Sarah Palin actually doesn't look bad because the average level of giving in the United States is between 2 and 3 percent. So 3.8 percent, that's quite generous compared to what the average American household does. Obama giving a little more than double what the average American household does. So pretty good, but not as good as McCain. And then Joe Biden looks awful again, 0 0.3 percent of his and his wife's income. Okay. So, that's the gossip that I wanted to go through, but I want to tell one more story which will help get us into some of the main points I would make in this talk. And the story concerns the founding, you can't see this picture very well, that's Toby Ward. Um, and as uh, Per said, he was the founder of the organization giving what we, what we can. And let me tell you a little bit about how that started.